Hello, everybody, and welcome Hi. to a very special episode of EFAP Movies. We got a whole list of things that make this special, but I prefer to start with the obvious being from the title we're covering The Descent, a film that I and many others consider a horror classic. Tightly written, wonderfully shot, pays to perfection. It also boasts several homages to classic horror and, uh, well, taking advantage of subverting a lot of horror tropes, I'd say, with an impressive use of a smaller budget and, hell, it's a movie that might just scare the shit out of you. Now, it's got a very good and strong reputation and hopefully we can spend the whole day talking about it, or at least the whole video. But the real reason that this is such a special episode is that we have the director of The Descent <gasps> with us today, Mr. Neil Marshall. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. Sir. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Awesome to meet you, honestly, because <laughs> this has been a, a, a pretty well-liked movie for me for a long time. So uh, to meet anyone behind works that give me some great experiences is always something I'm after. But uh, before we go into it, um, for those who don't know who Neil is, I'm sure you'll be aware of his work, even if you don't recognize his name. Dog Soldiers is one of the most recognizable from his filmography, I'd say, being a brilliant British action horror movie, complete with werewolves and a wonderful oh. sense of humor. We, of course, have The Descent that we'll be talking about today, and then we have a flurry of other entries that I'm sure people will recognize, like uh, Doomsday, post-apocalyptic action movie set in the UK, Centurion, historical war movie filled with... All kinds of action, focusing on a group of survivors uh, after a big old bloody battle, which uh, then took you to some interesting sets of directorial positions for television, including Black Sails, Constantine, Hannibal, Timeless, Westworld, Lost in Space, and of course, Game of Thrones. Neil, you directed, I think, one of the two of the most beloved episodes of the entire show, being Blackwater, which... Uh, Featured a battle that finally gave Game of Thrones fans a lot of what they were looking for in the series, being a battle. And uh, you directed the ninth episode of season four, which I can just say, Watchers on the Wall just so happens to be my favorite episode of the entire series. Ooh, good on you for that. <laughs> it's fucking yeah. great. Oh, yeah. Cool. Love to talk to you about that. Alas, we, <laughs> we have plenty to talk about today anyway. Neil, more so recently. He's blameless for season eight. That's good. That's good. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. He can stay. More recently, you've wrote and directed 2020's The Reckoning and 2022's The Lair, the former being a horror movie set in the 1660s and the latter being more of an action horror with a little bit of sci-fi. In any case, sir, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Very much thank you to Critical Drinker for connecting us. And well, why don't we start oh, with um, when it comes to The Descent? What in particular, if there was anything, gave you a sort of spark for writing a story like this? It, it originally came out of a challenge, but somebody was reviewing dog soldiers and they said well this is this is all very well it's a british horror movie but it's also kind of play for laughs like when is somebody going to make another really scary british horror movie and i kind of thought that felt like the gauntlet had been thrown down so mm. i said that as my task was to, to do much more of a straight out terrifying horror movie without so many of the laughs without any laughs really and try and make it as, not just literally dark because it's set in the dark quite a lot but as dark in tone as possible and, and give it a really bleak ending because i love a good bleak ending for a horror movie there's a bunch of challenges there and i kind of this i guess out. would bring us to an interesting discussion that we can have later as well um unless you want to do it now about the the american audiences weren't so keen on that bleak ending and so you had a slightly different version for for different audiences um i was yeah. always curious to know what you thought about that yeah i mean i'll, I'll point it out when we get to it because the, you know the, the, ultimately the difference is about 30 seconds at the end of the movie i always thought it was bizarrely misguided that that, that the ending that i had that, that i intended which we'll see today i believe because it's, it's the unrated version it'll have oh, the yes. full ending on. In, in some ways inspired by the ending of brazil terry gilliam's brazil the notion that the character basically goes insane but within their insanity they're actually find some kind of happiness you know our character's case is like she's reunited with her daughter so <laughs> that was some kind of bizarre even though she's physically she's doomed in her mind she's found some kind of happiness whereas the american ending which basically cuts off the ending of the film by 30 seconds suggests that she escapes from the cave but mm -hmm. the the problem with that to me is that that's to be worse for her she's like she's completely insane all of her friends are dead all of her family's dead she's probably going to get blamed for it all anyway she's probably going to spend the rest of her life in an asylum or something or you know prison for all this how do you explain it you know so i just didn't see that as being a happy ending but hey <laughs> I really like your interpretations as well, because like there are so many directions you can take it. A lot of people do split them up into happy and sad ending, which is it feels mm -hmm. a little um a lack a of nuance, you could say. <laughs> like it's, yeah. It feels like there's a lot going on and a lot of it is uh peppered throughout the film, setting up exactly what a mental state is and what those endings can mean. No need to put in concrete any one particular 
uh, meaning, especially when you have multiple cuts of the ending. But uh, it's super interesting to think about. And um, I think so. And I and I like to keep some stuff kind of vague in in here because mm-hmm. there's been various kind of like essays and things written about what it what it all means and are the creatures for real? Are they not real for real? All this kind of stuff. And I just I like the fact that people like to discuss that. I'm not going to say one way or the other. I think ambiguity is a great thing to have in movies like this. You yeah. know, to inspire that kind of speculation, and especially films that deal with you know, with emotional and mental trauma. It's like it's ripe for something like that so i just went with the flow you mentioned the goal to create um a relatively bleak ending although that was sort of something you had in mind from the beginning what do you think um sort of drives you toward that is it the lack of sort of bleak endings in cinema typically speaking a little bit uh, a little bit of that but also because some of my favorite movies have really bleak endings i mean being another um brilliant example of you know, essentially, a kind of an open-ended, open to interpretation. Oh yeah, kind of bleak. End. Yeah, they don't the just defeat well. the creature and everyone's happy. It doesn't quite end that way. Yeah, I mean that was another sort of benchmark for me doing this plot. But yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it's sensibilities, but I kind of like that kind of stuff. Oh no, especially I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I especially, I mean, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I felt like this. That was the more real ending. It felt um, a little bit less believable that she could escape almost so easily, and. Uh, yes. You know, dragging her back felt appropriate, even though it's you know, depending on the viewer, might consider it even more horrifying. Yeah, we've and we even like shot the the way the way that she does escape. You'll see later on that the way that she, we shot the escape was sort of almost stylized. It almost looks like she's kind of climbing the stairway to heaven or something like that. Mm-hmm. This god light coming down from the sky. You know, it was all deliberately done that way. But uh, but we'll see all that later on. Um, and the, and the, the the other kind of origins of it are that uh, after, on the back of Dog Soldier, I was approached by this company called Thelador Productions, who are most famous for creating Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. But they were setting up a film branch, and they had done one film, and they'd saw D- uh, Dog Soldiers, they liked it, so I, I got invited in to meet the producers, and they said, "Well, what would you like to do next?" And the first thing I presented them with was it's basically the feature length version of my student graduation film, which is all about zombies on an oil rig. Um, that could be cool. Uh, they looked at it, they said, we love it, but um, there's just no way we can afford it. So have you got anything else that's small? And so when I had the meeting in London. I got on the train back to Newcastle that day. And by the time I'd reached Newcastle, I'd come up with the descent on the train. And then it was just like, the, the stories fell into place quite quickly. Once it became about, you know, going into caves. I was like, caves are dark. You don't have to build so many sets. That could be cheaper. <laughs> Yeah. We did the whole film in, in a black room. It never quite worked out that way, but uh, it certainly was manageable that way. Dog Soldiers was uh, it's quite a different film to The Descent. Um, what were like, some of the lessons that you learned from making that film and going through the process of creating that story and then moving on to The Descent, which is darker, more serious in tone? Well, certainly w- working with the ensemble cast, because both of them has like, you know, it's an ensemble cast in both yeah. films, almost like an equal number of people in a way. It was a very testosterone-y, blokey kind of thing in, in Dog Soldiers, with the one exception of Megan and this one it was like the complete flip side of like let's try an all female cast and see where that goes and it became a different kind of flavor completely but the lesson I mainly learned was about working with the actors and not I had six years to prepare dog soldiers in terms of like how long it took to get the money together during that six years not only was I rewriting the script but I was also I shot listed the entire film and I storyboarded the entire film and on about day two or three I ended up throwing all that in the trash because uh, you know the actors were not standing where I thought they were going to stand three years earlier. You know they're not doing that. They have ideas and thoughts and they want to bring to the table. And it's like, right, okay, so this is how we're going to do it. And it was real eye opener. It was and it was a much more inventive and collaborative process doing it that way. So I didn't bother doing any kind of shot lists or whatever for the descent. We just figured it out as we went through. Right. So a kind of uh, more of like a spontaneous approach to storytelling, like throughout production. Yeah, well, a spontaneous approach to blocking and shooting scenes and working with the cast on set. Uh, obviously, sure. sticking. We had a we'd worked for, you know, for a couple of years or whatever to get the script right, and then that was pretty much locked in cement by the time we shot it. From a logistical point of view, like what was the biggest challenge of shooting the descent? Well, I suppose it's figuring out how to do the cave because the script was very, very specific. It was very linear, like it went from one chamber to the next chamber to the next chamber and each chamber presenting certain set of problems. So we very quickly realized we're never going to film this in a real cave because we're never going to find caves that fit the profile perfectly. Like you have to scout like 100 caves and we might find something that fits what it needs to be in the script. So plus we'd probably all die if we went down and tried to film in real caves. We did some caving with the cast advanced just to get I went down just to get into the, the, the mindset, really, having, you know, getting into the pitch black and crawling through little spaces and stuff like that. And that was a real adventure, but it certainly 
taught me that like filming in real caves was somebody was going to die. So it then became a question of like, well, how can we build them a set and make it affordable and manageable? And once that decision was made, it was like, okay, that's how we're going to do it. And it's like little technological things of like this new kind of foam spray had just been invented that you have this huge gun that just sprays foam everywhere and it sets hard like rock and you can spray it into molds or you can carve it into shapes or you can do all sorts of stuff with it and doing that as opposed to plaster work which would have been the old school way of doing it actual plaster work everywhere which weighs a ton and costs a fortune that really saved us so having these foam caves built around wooden structures and about i think we built i think it was like 10 sets altogether and some of them were like tiny some of them one of them was huge and we re- reused it about five times in the film um, <laughs> but some of them were tiny uh, but every set got used one one in set in particular i think we used it 12 times in the film for different locations but you can't tell because each time we'd go and spray it a little bit differently or move a rock around or any little tricks like that and you'd never know it was the same place. So the crew did a fantastic job on achieving that because as you're watching the film it really does feel like they're going through different chambers and the sets themselves look fantastic. Oh yeah I had no idea that it was all like constructed when I watched the movie the first time. I mean I learned it afterwards that all of these sets had been like made and built and changed and altered and it was like wow how especially the fact that some of them were miniatures mm. as i had learned but they look so yeah, real that's... i was legitimately fooled by it's it. a couple of matte paintings there's a couple of miniature shots that extension things like that but there isn't a real cave in the whole movie anyway that's so... impressive yeah, yeah. So that's that's the cheat when we were in a cave we constantly had um guys with like spritzes uh, or a hose pipe or whatever like above the set just like having this misty rain and water running down the walls and hanging in the air i think that just really helped give it a sense of being in a real place that kind of effort goes a huge way because that that work they've done Does. and uh, you directed of course that it's forever the descent is forever and it's really mm-hmm. uh, well i meant to say i should have said it earlier go watch this film before watching us watch it okay <laughs> like you gotta yeah. go experience it <laughs> what it Pause is this first. video right now yes. go watch it we'll wait for you yes we'll, we'll right wait for you go you to your local theaters and buy a ticket for the descent <laughs> and watch it because this is not going to be the ideal way to watch the movie we'll be probably doing a lot we'll, of talking there will be spoilers and... yes <laughs> oh no yeah but yeah, do that. Before we begin, though, what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ooh, it's a all pretty right. solid That's, choice. That is a very fair answer. We'd all be right. greedy you enough to for stay. two more. Uh oh. Okay, uh, Alien and um, Good choice. American Werewolf in London. Hey. <laughs> I'm noticing something <laughs> oh, with these. Yeah. All right. I assume the, the thing has got to be up there as well. Thing would probably be my next choice. We recently rewatched that. That film is phenomenal as well. It is so good. Yeah, um, yeah it doesn't surprise me that you like Raiders so much. Uh, with you know how we talked about you know things beforehand, the the Indiana Jones kind of occulty, you know, adventurous take on classic horror stuff and those mystical elements. Yeah, it seems like it'd be right up your alley. When the guy's face melts again, it's all good. <laughs> Dude, yes, were uh, absolutely. Were you a big fan of Dial of Destiny, Neil? Oh. <laughs> to bring the tone down <laughs> what do you mean there were only three indiana jones movies of course what, yeah what you, sorry what do you mean <laughs> my trilogy mistake. was great yeah it's a good trilogy i, I might weep into my coffee so let's not go there <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> well then on an uplifting note would you guys like to watch the descent unrated mm-hmm. absolutely it's the old Lionsgate logo, isn't it? They don't use that one anymore. Don't I really like the old one. Yeah, I prefer the old it one. It looks cool, yeah. Wasn't there it's like a little steampunky thing going on? It has lions and a gate. So Pathé's, Pathé's the, the kind of one of the, the, the big heroes here. Uh, Lionsgate obviously only picked it up for the, for the US distribution, and, and ultimately they're the ones who suggested the, the edited version. Pathé, Pathé are the, the British ones, aren't they? They finance a lot of movies yeah. here in the UK. Pathé distributed Dog Soldiers, and then they picked up on this one but Salador produced and financed this one thank you Salador um, thank you Salador. thank you thank you for paying the bills he did a good one get Neil in to do more movies like this please <laughs> they kind of retired after they did Slumdog Millionaire and they won tons of Oscars lots of money and stuff for that and then they basically packed it in after that it was kind of like you know hmm. quit while you're ahead they went on a high, with, on a high <laughs> with that one yeah. yeah that's my niece the little girl oh really, <laughs> oh, really? that's cool Film's yeah tower. well she was six then so now she's 20 yeah uh, 26 sorry she liked yeah, this movie yeah. so this well, she saw it when she was about 10. Oh, my <laughs> totally goodness. Unfa- <laughs> she was totally unfazed by it because she'd been on set and she'd met uh, yeah. creatures. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I suppose so. Makes you look at the film different. 
And the actresses oh. are doing the white water rafting here. I think it's they great. Are. It gives you a little insight as well, straight away into the personalities of each of them. Like, which one's the fun-loving, adventurous one? Which one's a bit more, like, you know, um, conservative and cautious? Just by their reactions to going over the, the, the falls there. That's quite cool. The alpha females, and the beta females, and stuff like that within the group. It's really interesting. Yeah. Because, like, when we get to the uh, third act, these three particularly, and they're... You know what relationships are shared between them are going to be the most important. Yeah, I'm sure you've all noticed the font. Yes. Um, this yeah. Classic carpenter co font. This is the first time I'd used it. It's very fitting. Got these looks. They tell you everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Man, Doesn't yeah, have to I... beat you over the head with it. Expressions say a well, lot. There are, there are people who can see this film and have no idea that there's like an, a fair subplot idea happening. Because uh, it'll just be watching for like the more overt stuff. But I I love the subtlety. Mm -hmm. It's nice when a film. Gives me a little bit of credit. <gasps> Barbie, no, ha. Ah. <laughs> no, I'm <having> flashbacks. <laughs> no, uh. So I, yeah, I was trying to come up with a way for like this, this what's coming up to be even more of a shock, and I kind of thought, well, let's put it midway through the credits when people are expecting the credits to finish, then something happens. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll just stick it in the middle of the credits somehow. <laughs> Great effect. Oh, that was such a great shot. <laughs> it's worth noting the hand here, isn't it? Oh yeah, I said to twitch your hand. Yes. <laughs> nice gross detail. But uh, yeah, grisly and gives you an idea of what you might be able to expect. And then I added in the blood coming out of the back of the car as well to imply what happened with the daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be fair, so like he drifts on the road there because of uh, he's feeling conflicted about the current relationships, right? He's Yeah, he's, he's not exactly on the ball. It's arguable that that is what caused the crash to happen. Certainly. So there was a scene here that we actually filmed, she got cut out quite early on when she wakes up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, um, she comes out into the corridor. We shot a scene where there's a crawler scuttling around at the end of the corridor in the shadows. Mm. Um, and it was kind of, I don't even remember if it was in the script or not. I think maybe it was, but the implication, it was like, just like here, that she, it goes dark and she turned around and she saw this like shape scuttling around on the floor. And I guess it was all to do with like, well, there are these demons of the mind, but I thought it made it too, that effect. kind of what she's reacting to there. It kind of makes it too implicit that it's stuff going on in her head. Yeah, the idea that like none of this... And is, like none of it is actually happening, and it's all just like her, you know. Trauma. Because there's a lot like, being made of this visual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is all in the corridor at Pinewood Studios. We, we had to take down all the Carry On movie posters off the wall <laughs> to make it look like a hospital. It really, it really does uh, look like a hospital, though. It does, yeah. The, the lino floors and everything. People in uniforms, they go a long way. It looks like a kind of Victorian English hospital, that's for sure. Mm. I think there's always something really compelling about just um, a very strained cast you know just a small group of people but you get to really delve into each of their characters and like what they do and how they relate to each other becomes a massive focal point then i certainly took that from john carpenter on the thing and an mm -hmm. alien and such like and then yeah uh, assault and precinct 13 as well which is one of my favorites but um it, yeah, yeah he took that yeah. from How howard hawks who liked to do films with these sort of people in, in these situations so i love that i love that kind of dynamism obviously that like, we just passed the chatuga national park sign which is a reference to deliverance there's a lot of deliverance homages here Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Um, and the shining references with the overhead shots of the car, mm. like all, all the all the favourites, all the favourites, and but all all of this stuff was shot in the Scotland or you know back park behind Pinewood Studio, Pine Studios. I was, was going to um, say the like, Appalachian as a, Mountains. All. As a Brit, like it does definitely look like you know British roads and British countryside and stuff. But it, I mean, even me, you know, as as the American here, uh, everything from the little bullet holes on the rural, you know, signs to, of course, the left hand driving car. Yeah, it, I didn't know where it was. If you asked me where it was shot, I'd be like, I don't know, it's Appalachians, I guess, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, maybe the north, uh, northwest, you know, someplace like that. It's well, feels like home. That's the balance, I presume, uh, Neil. You're always trying to get it to a point where it is plausible. It is viable. You don't need to make it like extreme and make sure you nail everything but make sure you can get the audience there sort of thing that's trying to sell it as something that it isn't i mean this log cabin in the woods this is uh it's called berkhamstead just outside of london just randomly found a log cabin in the woods <laughs> i was like oh well, that'll do because you know i'm gonna be able to build one yeah i mean i don't know i look at it and go well that's patently good now because it just looks autumn autumn england but i guess i know it that's the trouble i can't dissociate myself from knowing exactly where it is one tries. And the other thing is, is that inside that log cabin, there was literally just one room. He dressed about three times as being the living room and two different bedrooms, hmm. just by ad adding in a couple of extra walls and stuff like that. Filmmaking magic, eh? Tricks. Yeah, we it's all down to uh, Simon Bowles, a production designer, who's just a genius. Yeah, but we can make the caves work. We can make this cabin work, goddammit. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's very cozy looking. We take a lot of time during the early portion of the film building all of these characters. What was the thought process behind slowing down and focusing in on these people and their interactions with each other? I like a slow build for something like this. The films that I like are slow builds, The Thing and Alien and The Exorcist and all mm -hmm. that stuff. That yeah. They take their, take their time. It was definitely something I learned from Dog Soldiers of like, if people are going to care, if, you just, if, if it's just like bullet fodder or whatever it is, characters that line up to be killed, I want people to feel their deaths. I want people to feel, so Absolutely. let's take the time to get to know these these girls care about them a bit before we start butchering them yeah. well they're, they're all important. interesting like that this is the thing like they they don't really come across as just like stock characters that like oh i can tell this person's gonna get killed right away or whatever like they're all they've got enough personality and enough depth to them that like yeah okay quite invested oh, yeah. in each of them like it's not predictable yeah. in like an eye rolling kind of way it's like oh you're the this archetype you're the this you'll die first you'll die second you'll die the <laughs> uh, you'll be the coward you'll be you're the horny one blah, blah, blah. we really kind of strayed away from more obvious kind of stereotypes i guess for female characters in this kind of film yes, thank you and i really like i you know i had to fight with some of the execs you know a little bit on that of like you know they were like well, why are they why do they, they all have to wear like woody jumpers and stuff like that can they not like be stripping off at this point or like <laughs> oh, they, <laughs> wanted, no. they wanted more stereotypical <laughs> stuff more uh huh. it's like p pajama party business you know <laughs> this is what the people want um, i suppose it, it's kind of a rare thing as well to have like a movie like this where it is an all-female cast you know i suppose it's not been done a huge number of times and you know, it, it's done in such a way here that it just feels completely natural, like they're all friends. It yeah. makes sense for them to be here in this position, doing this stuff. Well, I did a lot of research into the, the, the climbing and caving kind of world before writing it. And it's like, yeah, that there, there's a lot of women out there doing it. I mean, this is 20 years ago now. There was then, there certainly is now. It's an international community. It's Everybody does it. And there's groups of women out there, uh, you know, doing it. So I was like, why shouldn't it be a group of women? They can all be mates and they can get on like mates and not have to be bitching and you know, all this kind of stuff behind each other's back. They can just be normal people. Yep. Yeah. 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 They drink beer and they can fart and whatever the fuck it is that they, they do. <laughs> hey, uh, they just ladies like... don't fart. My mom told me. <laughs> just before we had uh, oh, uh the first overt reference to Juno's necklace. Yeah. And I will say, uh it's impressive. We're uh what, thirteen minutes in. I mean, you've set the foundation for almost everything because as much as there's no stereotypes because I, I totally agree with that, we've still got pieces of each of them that are going to be relevant once the story moves on, being Juno's already been set up as slightly distant yet uh, the sort of action woman of the lot, which is an interesting dynamic to keep pushing, especially that she's the one that gets everybody to do all of the extreme sports, all of the fun mm. outings. It seems that she uses that to avoid uh, talking about more serious stuff, especially being that there's an affair behind all of it. And then, of course, we know exactly yeah. what our main character's going through. Then um, the protege to Juno, right? She's already made reference to how she's a go-getter. She likes the risks. She likes it's, doing... There's a re really obscure deliverance reference here, uh, which you can't see very well, but it's all to do with the fact that um, Beth here is lying with her arm twisted around the back of her head. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember the way that one of the characters is found in Deliverance, that he has his arm bent around the back of his head. <laughs> it's been a while um, since Ronnie... I've seen Deliverance, but I think I know what you mean. Okay, yeah. Ronnie Cox. He's got a dislocated arm around the back of his head. Anyway, uh, there this it is. moment. <laughs> that was a nice little jump scare. Uh, great little jump scare, but that came about uh, in the script phase because people were saying, well, you know, it doesn't. The first part of the movie doesn't read like a horror movie. We need something. So I thought, so I thought of putting a jump scare in there, and I think that one actually works really well. Oh yeah, yeah. thematically. Exactly. I mean, it, it's it also, very, very appropriate. It also, it also sets up the medication, like the yeah, yeah, it, beside a bed. It really helps get you in her head, yeah, yeah. physically too, so to speak. <laughs> what, what is the uh, the benchmark is for stuff like this? Like the the first fifteen minutes of a movie should establish your main character as your general setup, your stakes, and any of the, the sort of plot threads that you're going to pursue going forwards. And we are just at the 15 minute mark and we've essentially got all of that now yeah i think so i mean maybe not the stakes yet because we haven't seen you know i've gone down the cave but oh, we, uh, we kind of know why they're here if you know what i mean like and that there's, they're going to be doing this yeah. thing there's danger in rock climbing anyway right and cave exploring and spelunking and stuff if anyone didn't know which by the way i fully recommend people going into this movie without knowing what is going to happen that's like the best way to do it because the the crawlers man the reveal on those guys yeah up to this point sure. you're going to assume i i guess that something's going to go horribly wrong when they go exploring a cave yeah one way or another damn she's flexible yep yeah she's a dancer and whatever and she was like yeah, i can do this i was like great let's get in the movie, <laughs> <Welcome> <laughs> to the movie. this cost us nothing 
<laughs> it's just great to see them dicking around like this and being kind of goofy. Like it just yeah. kind of feels really natural. Like they they got a good camaraderie already. They feel like real people. Yeah. Oh my goodness. You don't. Get well, that you're going to be spending, you know, in these movies, you'll be spending what ninety minutes, two hours, sometimes more, with characters, and they don't bother to set aside a bit of time to tell us who they are and why we should care yeah it's crazy a lot of movies don't even set motivations why yeah do they, they're why does just anyone here. want to do anything <laughs> it's like who cares they're gonna get killed you're like oh okay oh, okay because there is a running sentiment that like horror films uh, especially of this kind where it's like a group of people and they're all gonna get killed one by one so to speak that you don't need to do much characterization but i've always felt and especially with this movie proving it too that the more characterization you do, the more impactful the deaths will be. Yeah, well, also because the characterization drives some of the choices and the, 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 mm -hmm. you know, the things that happen exactly because of who certain characters are. So, yeah, I think it's absolutely essential. I think and it was worth spending that, this time getting to know them and like them because it will pay off. I think as well with like the sort of cheaper, like nastier slasher flicks, like it was almost a case of having unlikable characters in your movie, so you didn't feel bad when you saw them get killed in a bunch of gory ways. Whereas yeah. with this, it's like, okay, you're, you're taking a bit more seriously because yeah. these are people who feel like real human beings and you're kind of invested in them and you don't want them to die necessarily, so it I means suppose... more when they start when they start getting bumped off. What's funny about that is that if you want an audience to feel indifferent about a death, or even happy that a particular character like an asshole character dies or something. Still accentuate that with character writing. It's always available as a tool. Feels almost like a waste when you don't. I feel like there are tons of little micro expressions in this scene between each of these characters that give you sort of an indication of each of their connections to one another. Yeah, it was like trying to set up a lot of stuff, like the watch that we just set up, and then mm -hmm. yeah. just the relationship between the sisters and then you know the irish girl who's like bored by you know is an adrenaline junkie and is kind of bored by the tourist trap aspect of the caves and it's also hinted that there's kind of a relationship between her and juno but it's, it's never implicit there's all sorts of little references and things like that going on all the time how do you feel about the notion that writing is essentially problem solving like you want to get these girls in a cave with monsters that have never been found before and you're like well how can i make that plausible in our world how can no one have ever been there before, yeah. or at least that we know of and stuff? Seems yeah, like right. It was researching and applying that to the writing of like understanding. Well, there are plenty of caves out there that nobody ever been to before, and the idea that if you go down a cave first, you get to name it and things like that is all part of mm -hmm. the research. And then there's the notion being that at some point Juno had found this place or you know and scouted it without actually really fully exploring it, but she scouted it a bit to bring them back here to for her own kind of satisfying her own ego, I suppose. Um, well, would you say uh, there is an element of that she really did think this she would? Because she brought them there to, to, you know, she maybe brought them there to kill them all. Oh, no. <laughs> for, <laughs> oh, my goodness. For, 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 for guilt over, the, over what she's been up to. A great way to get rid of Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so It feels like uh, overcompensation on Juno's part, like, to try and make up for things. I feel like this is a great, but that really it's something that she thoroughly enjoys. Because that does come up, right? Like, uh, Sarah asking I think it is, but that's also, also with Sarah, with with Juno, it's also a case that I think she, ultimately, her ego is stronger than her desire to make up for what she did wrong. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that she had the affair, right? Yeah. But, you know, she's happy to lead them into danger if it's going to help her. I find Juno, like, really interesting character, especially later on when shit starts to go down. Well, I mean, she's kind of my favorite. Switches from being... Because <laughs> she switches from being hero to villain, like, from moment to moment. This really is a really strong, layered, complicated character, which you'd love to see more of in film. And, I, you know, yeah. we'll get there, but the payoff you, you do give to her uh, is not something you see in stories really ever. Mm -hmm. Is that hat there supposed to be an Indiana Jones reference? No, definitely. I was, you know, it was a touch of the Indiana Jones in the hat for sure. This is the happiest the characters can be. So a little Indiana Hooray. Jones hat makes us feel good. <laughs> yeah, adventure. And it also, like, we missed a beat before, but that one of the characters basically lists off a whole bunch of shit that can happen in a, when you go down caving in terms of, like, how it can kill you, how it can drive you mad, how it can... Mm. You can get dehydration, disorientation, yeah, yeah, yeah. claustrophobia, yeah, yeah. panic attacks, paranoia, hallucinations... Cause you illusions, all this kind of stuff. And basically everything that she says happens later in the film. Pretty good use of uh, a green screen, I assume, there. Big goal. Some big piece of... Green. Yeah. <laughs> laid on it the does ground. Look very good. Very it's very rare to find holes that big in Britain, unfortunately. They must be cold. So this was literally just across the road from the cabin, but you can't tell. That's the mini the miniature in the background mm -hmm. there that uh miniature cave. It it's it's miniature. Though. It was like it looks pretty good. Yeah, it was like fifteen foot tall. It wasn't exactly you know, small. That's obviously 
set. I think there's another shot in a second of the miniature. Do you remember how the um, water was created with the miniature? I remember it being, it's not water, right? Salt. Salt, yeah. Salt. That's, that's, that's the oh, miniature Oh, salt, there. really? Look I had it. no idea. Looks great. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Interesting. Well, All these little really old, old, old school tricks. Really old school tricks, yeah. Well, so this is the stuff I love about filmmaking. You have like several forms of recording this whole section and they're all pieced together and they create like one understandable sort of progression. Oh, yeah. Events, which is really strong. The way your mind can... Like this, yeah, this is the shot that... This is the, the quote-unquote miniature, but it looks just real. It just looks real. They did such a fantastic job on it. It'll always look good. Holly, we do this safely in order following my lead, Okay. How very Probably adventurous it. and uh, gung-ho of her mm, to yes. come down yeah. so quickly down the rope. It's kind of interesting. I didn't really think about it at the time, but it was also sort of one of the first, not not the first, but to incorporate the use of like the video camera and the night vision stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, this is back in 2005 or four when you made it, maybe. Uh, so yeah, that is that's going back. This would be around about the well, just after the Blair Witch Project. Yes, after Blair Witch for sure. And this is before everyone was carrying around phones with flashlights and yeah. recording stuff. So well, you know those which, are before yeah. record. Fucking great film as well. Oh, I've heard very good things about Record. The great. Bats is kind of a an interesting, like not only can it be like a, a jump scare in this moment, but uh kind of a bit of foreshadowing to the nature of the crawlers and how they navigate their world. Uh, it the, is, yeah. Right. The sound and the use yeah, the way the bats work and how they survive in the dark and things. So is that the, shot? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's something satisfying about that. <laughs> the pick of well, destiny. Then. Well, when you've got a film that's assembled with care, you start to think, oh, everything has a purpose. Every shot has a function. I'm not just having my time wasted. There are... There's a reason for everything. It's all put together with care. These caves look really cool, but it's also now we get to into the portion of the film where all of the lighting is more or less attempting to be diegetic, right? Like torches, flashlights. It's what came out of the actual caving experience and a, a memory of mine from when I was a kid. I went to a school trip, I think, I don't know, must be like 12 or something like that. I was taken on a school trip down a mine. Um, at Ooh. some point, you're, you're down at the bottom of this mine and they, they, the guide said, okay, I want everybody to turn your lights off and um and you all turn your torches off and it was like the first time i experienced pitch black mm. like it's not like turning your lights off at home it's like there's just nothing and you can wave your hand right in front of your eyes you can't see a thing yep. um and then he says by the way don't wander off because there's like a thousand foot drop about you know 50 feet over there and this is like a bunch of school kids like you'd never be allowed to do that today no. <laughs> yeah but we were all like, we're not going anywhere. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, it really stuck in my mind, this notion of pitch black and how to utilize this for this film. So I, I said, like, I've seen movies set in caves before and they always have like random shafts of light poking out of nowhere or they have some glow that just lights everything up. I want to somehow do this whereby only light sources that we have in the cave are what they take with them. Uh, and it could be a lighter, it could be a torch, it could be a flare, it could be snap lights, it could be whatever it is. But anything else should be pitch black. We really stuck with that as much as we could, trying to make sure that we established light sources for each scene. I think there's only one that we kind of cheated a little bit on, but that's later on. Well, I have to say, I really uh, appreciate the, the whole, sensibility because... A lot of films don't care. They're just like, eh, we'll light the whole place up. It's fine. If they only have a... Match. Make it look pretty. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, it, it really uh, accentuates the horror, doesn't it? Because dark is dark, and it can get really dark in this film. Like, I mean, look at this scene. <laughs> like, like, look at this yeah. shot. Yeah. And it's just literally like, the only light is what's coming off a torch. It's bouncing off rocks or, or water or whatever. And that's great. And the great thing about using the sets over again is that the actors like rarely shone their lights in exactly the same place every time. So the fact that you're standing in the same set as the previous scene, you just have no idea. Well, yeah, not um, only does it look really great, but it also just it ties into what we're talking about, right? All of the little tricks to essentially get as much out of what you had as possible. Like, what better way to reuse sets than to have them be dimly lit? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it enabled us to cheat quite a lot. Did you find yourself Wasn't having it? to hold back a bit on wanting to drop crawler clues? Or did you put in as many as you were actually wanting to do, like, from the get-go? I think everything was in there that I wanted, and it was just, like, a little hint here, a little hint there. I mean, like, she found sort of bloody finger yeah, marks the fingerprints. on the mm -hmm. down there. I don't even know what that means. It's like, <laughs> you put this idea in there, oh, bloody fingerprints, like, what does that mean? It's like, was well, that a crawler made those marks, or is it? A previous victim or something like that it's like what what is that <laughs> nothing um, good because nothing good yeah. it's certainly nothing that we nothing that we chose to explain beyond that and i think it's nice to not explain everything all the time i Let the will figure things out 
as they go along, you know, give them credit as a viewer that they can piece uh, things together and sort of speculate on their own terms. Yeah, absolutely. The real crawler appearance doesn't happen until like 45 minutes from the end of the film or 40 minutes from the end of the film. Yeah, there is a long build up to it. It's uh, a remarkable amount of restraint, I would say, to hold off for that long. But I think that was a really beneficial choice because you just get all of these little yeah. clues and a lot of time where things are normal, you know, relatively speaking. It accentuates the horror of that. Relatively point, yeah. normal, but it, but it's it's also just trying to establish that the cave itself is is bloody dangerous and unpleasant. And, mm -hmm. well, yeah, and you know, before and we start distracting the audience. Yeah. So that and, cave there that she just crawled into was quite specifically designed. It's talked about on the making of, but it was specifically designed to look like a vagina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was crawling slime into, as well? Yeah, the slime mm. as well. So there was a notion, and it's certainly been discussed in many different things, but it was somebody, uh, it was actually Emma Cleesby, um, who played uh, Megan in Dog Soldiers, who read the script and she said, this cave thing, it's basically like a journey through like a female body. You know, you have all the you go into the mouth and down the throat and all this kind of stuff and there's like the concept of rebirth at the end there's like there's a stomach cave which is all full of dead animals there's like the, she, what she, she termed it the menstrual cave which was the, <laughs> which was like the womb because it had all the blood in the blood cave stuff like that and I just thought that was fascinating the and theory, yeah. we started applying that to making of it it was like well also like a, taking a leaf out of Alien which like you know some of the when they go into the derelict spacecraft like the openings to the, the mm -hmm. ship are patently like big, big vaginas um, mm. and it's full of eggs you know playing around with that kind of stuff just for, it's just fun you know it's just kind of fun details you can't really tell watching the movie and then a little trick here for getting the camera into this tunnel to do a tracking shot of her crawling along the tunnel there we literally like screwed the camera to the end of a plank of wood like shoved the camera and plank of wood into the <laughs> hole and then dragged it out but in front of the actor and it, like it worked a fucking treat hey if it works it works what's the yeah. funny thing right sometimes it comes across probably while you're doing it as a nightmare but then when you've done it you're like that was pretty, that was good. <laughs> that was problem solved, you yeah? know? A deleted moment is after they leave this cave, they cut back to the apple that one of them was eating, sitting on a rock. And this hand just comes in and like takes the apple and you hear like a crunch sound. <laughs> so, but, I, but I cut it out because it was just too, it was too much too soon. Too obvious, yeah. Uh, yeah, because yeah, technically speaking, the only reference we've got so far is something that you, uh, it was a stuntman or a crew member in the shot when they were um, first arriving into the sort of big portion of the cave and you ended up uh... oh yeah 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 <laughs> we left it exactly as it is if you see it you see it if you don't you don't but yes there's a guy's face in the shadows one of the props guys or something who just happened to be standing there but it ends up working so, out okay right because like most people won't be able to see exactly what it is but they'll see something move and they'll be like wait a minute like, yeah that's oh, fine don't worry about it <laughs> i will become the prop. this scene is just Lovely, like I, I think it's easy. To, yeah, lovely is like, just how I'd explain it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it's you know, I'm not particularly claustrophobic myself, but like, and I appreciate this idea of just being caught in this like this really narrow underground passage, like so far from help that no one's going to be able to get to you, and just getting jammed. Well, and it's, it's just so cool. And you take the chance here not only to create this horror sequence, but to bond further these two characters, to let the audience know how much these two will be invested in each other, yeah. right? Mm. Absolutely, that these two are close friends. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to try and achieve was a sense that we weren't cheating the camera angles too much. Like the cameras, I wanted to feel like the camera was in the cave with them all the time. It wasn't stuck through a hole in the wall. So it felt like, you know, we were squeezing the camera in with the actors mm. to make it even more claustrophobic. Because well, really um, like you see the dust in the air and everything. It's like you can tell it's yeah. right in amongst it. And so, yeah, I mean, that was a big thing with this was like, I figured going in making this film, I wanted to make it claustrophobic, but I figured maybe like three people out of 10 suffered from claustrophobia. And <laughs> the response that I got to the film suggests it's more like nine out of 10. <laughs> like, because everybody got fucked well, up. Well, I got to hand scene. it to you, man. I think it's the way you've, the way the scene's created. There's something disturbing about the, the idea, because the, especially the darkness surrounding the, the yeah. portion that they're even in. The whole thing is lit by the two torches. That's it. Yeah, and so it, it it goes where it goes. And my face is not. If it doesn't hit the walls, it's black. When the wall moves, their um, their recognition of the change in tone. <laughs> Here's your oh shit moment. Like, yep. Uh oh. He's like, no, yeah. <laughs> no time to act chill anymore. You have to actually get out. Good use of music too. It comes in. Uh, it's a, it's a good sound that comes in at the right moment. I feel, and an otherwise fairly subdued soundtrack. Mm -hmm. to this yeah, point, I was certainly. kind of. I, was, I really liked the use of the breaths, the panicked breathing, all kind of stuff for that, for that scene. And then the birthday cake visual comes back for the second time. Five candles. At this moment, 
the thing with the birthday cake is she was gonna have her birthday party and it was gonna be her fifth birthday party or something so she's she's she only has five candles on there but i think at the very end of the film when you see the cake again it's got six candles on it this reminds me of um aliens when uh the way they integrate into the walls when the marines first mm. get down into the sort of hive and you would, yeah and you would never know yeah, just like, looking at it this scene in order to have the continuity right every time so at the beginning of each take you have to blast an air can of air mortar full of this full of earth stuff into the set at the beginning of every single take so that as the scene went on it would progressively like clear um just to have the continuity but i don't think you can do that anymore i think that full of earth stuff's been banned because <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, like a carcinogen or something well love of the craft <laughs> they survived yeah they're right they survived. yeah they're, they're all right and look what we got we got the descent so it was worth it. Also, I think that uh, the stakes at this point become very clear. Like, it's it's really, really easy to grasp, right? They're in a cave that they nobody found before, which means nobody's going to come rescue them. And they're stuck, so they have no yeah. choice but to press on, right? To descend further yeah. into the depth of the cave. Absolutely. And I hear, here we go. I think it's like she's just... Yeah, this is the what I would consider the reveal, sort of. But uh, yeah, I really think this is well done. Oh, that's so good. There he is. The same shot that come back like, is gone. Yeah. yeah. So good. It's subtle. Her reaction to it is like perfectly natural. Like, what the hell? Did I just see what I just saw? That kind of thinking. The imagination kicking well, in. Like maybe. She, uh, as she goes on and gets more clues, she starts to sort of piece it together, right? Each of them individually is like, huh. But then, you know, more information comes along and then it starts to paint the picture, right? There is somebody down here in this cave. It's also fun playing around with the guy that, you know, the one who starts to see stuff also yeah. happens to be the one who may or may not be, you know, be kind of crazy, who's on medication, stuff like that. So then, you know, she's the, what she's the, um, the unreliable narrator, yeah. So yes, there's another set, which we used a few times, but it's a different style of rock formation and things like that, trying to create the bottomless chasm. Did you have a clear image of these sorts of visuals, like this particular massive drop before you made the film? Yeah, no, absolutely. I had a, I had an idea of what I wanted. I, I'm not sure how to achieve it, but it's also, well, how can we show it's a really massive drop if it's pitch black? Mm -hmm. So then it was the idea, well, yeah, let's throw a rock over the edge of one over in a few seconds or something like that, and it goes, goes. Um, yeah, you hear yeah. the noise. I, can, I I worked it out of like yeah, how far is. that actually is, and it's like it's an insanely high amount of you know that rock falls a long way in a short time. So you know it's like a skyscraper down there. It really is striking the sort of red and black contrast in these scenes, like and especially with these wide shots, like with all of the markings in the wall. It's a really striking visual. Yeah. Yeah, I love the red light. The use of the view. We use the flares an awful lot. Mm -hmm. um, makes it very hellish. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's. I also think it's really interesting that that was pretty cool. That yeah. shows the bottomless pit. But the idea that she starts to see the crawlers as the team starts to fall apart. Yeah, something that this scene accomplishes, like aside from being a really tense moment, is it shows just how competent um, these characters are. They're they're quite good at what they're doing here. Yeah, but the, it still feels yeah. very precarious. The sort of rock climbing element of it isn't just to get them in. We see this; it's relevant basically throughout the film. Yeah, and like, I really wanted to incorporate incorporate all that kind of stuff. It achieves so much. We did cut it down a little bit because, like, as you can see that she's carrying a drill hanging from a. A belt, mm. and we want to. You know, I did film all this detail of the other side and drilling into the rock and putting in batons and all this kind of stuff. So we definitely whittled it down a bit to get rid of all that stuff. This is the first clue here that there are uh, the people have come down here before. Yeah, which no, um, I've never heard about. Oh, wow, well, exactly. That's a great trope in horror movies, like the the previous expedition that uh, that fell foul of whatever things lurking in there. You know, yeah. and you just pick up little clues about what happened to them. Such a great well, thing. Yeah. Such a great effect. Something I appreciate is that it's it's a like it's not acknowledged at this moment, you know, putting the pieces together. There's evidence that people have been down here, but nobody's heard of this cave before. Like that starts to become more apparent later on, right? As you sort of get more clues about people coming down here, piecing it together, it's not super overt. Yeah, well, it's followed on from a conversation that states that if you the first down a cave, you get to name it. So, well, if this, mm -hmm. if this thing, this cave is unexplored, then what happened to these guys? Exactly. And, you know, there's certainly been some discussions of, you know, could you do a, a descent, like, prequel about, about those, you know, these first explorers. The problem with that, as with any prequel, is you kind of know how it ends to a degree. Yeah. <laughs> because you can try and throw a few twists and turns... One twist and turn could be that the crawlers are the first people who mm. try to mm. 
<laughs> oh my god. There was um, a movie I reviewed once called Deathline, and it's uh, it's set in the London Underground, and it's like uh, in the gap. Yeah, yeah, mind the gap. And it's uh, it's like people who were excavating a new sort of section of the underground back in the turn of the century, and there was a cave in, and they got trapped. And look, what you see now is like the descendants of those original people, and they've sort of descended into cannibalism, and they're basically just like beasts at this point. And I just like the idea of you know these people trapped so far from from civilization, they just basically turn into animals over time. Well, that, I mean that's a fun one anyway, because they're not really they're not trapped as such they they chose to stay there yeah they kind pray of, yeah. on they prey on people late at night on the tube stations they grab them and snatch them and drag them into the dark and stuff like that. so they're kind of like crawlers yeah yeah and there's only like one left by the end and he's like kind of simultaneously horrible and like kind of pitiful at the same time and i think it's a great great thing to play with in a horror movie you do wonder yeah. if uh, anyone's made the video you know the crawlers did nothing wrong yeah, <laughs> there'll be a video essay out there. There's somewhere. an argument. Oh no, totally. And that's, that's again, it was discussed when we were making the film. Is that you know, is this actually look at it from a different point of view? It's like a home invasion movie. These girls basically invading the crawler's space. You know, they were they were living their life peacefully, eating a few deer and stuff like that. But there's no indication that it preyed on people that much. Well, like until they find the skulls, right? Or unless the well, skulls later are... on, yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. A lot of them are animals. A lot of animal skulls. Well, in theory, um, some of the skulls could just be crawler skulls, I guess. Yeah. In, in Dog Soldiers... It's oh, this injury. Oh. 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 In this entire scene with this, uh, you know, in the, this canyon here, this gap, it's been very reddish. It's very nice on the eyes. It still gives the feeling that it's dark. It's not a bright light. It's kind of, it's, it's mm. kind of a reserved light. It doesn't overpower you. Oh, uh, definitely, yeah. That's Oof. brutal. <laughs> I, l I love what you're doing in this scene as well, because it's like you're showing them doing like pretty impressive things physically, but like they're never they never verge into like superhuman territory. Like they're never capable yeah. of like things that you you know are clearly ridiculous. I'm very keen on maintaining that that yeah they fall and they get injured. As you say, there's nothing superhuman about these girls at all. You're really keen on maintaining that. When she gets cut, it fucking hurts. Yeah. And for how claustrophobic it is, you don't. It doesn't feel unpleasant as a viewing experience. It still feels like you can tell what's going on. You get a clear progression of what's happening. You can tell who is who. It's not like a blurry film or a film that's so dark you can't tell what's happening. Very well shot in that regard with respect to the audience. Yeah, to, to it was trying to find that balance of making it dark but not confusing. Yeah, it's never confusing. It's kind of uh, interesting that this feels like, you know, giving giving sort of a glimmer of hope of, oh, wow, there might be another exit to this cave, and it's really not long until we start seeing the uh, the crawlers. Yeah. Well, we take that hope away. And it achieves, like, if this is artwork, who made it, and when, mm -hmm. and what happened to them, and... Trying to put put some context in the crawlers themselves, mm. as we, you know, we described, not in the film, but I described them outside of the film as, like, you know, they're the cavemen that didn't leave the cave and evolve outside. I think that's a really solid idea, and I do, uh, I quite like your decision to not make that so explicit and overt that the characters theorize that sort of that that scene is in almost all horror movies with a monster of some kind. Music here is a very thing uh ask isn't it uh yes <laughs> <laughs> there he is yeah there it is yeah. and save for like the 47 minute mark what's well, the thing right if you hadn't been paying enough attention that might be the first time you go wait a minute like the, yeah oh my god it's just kind of there but it's like what is it doing is it mm. listening is it stalking them that one. Hey, holly. well we already set up earlier that holly is kind of yep. the renegade goes in fast but not very Perpetuous. cautiously yeah mm -hmm. i think giving uh the first like two injuries being from just exploring the cave emphasizes just how dangerous the environment is and then throwing the crawlers on top oh it's yeah you, yeah it starts to feel so hopeless close. i wanted to try and choose kind of injuries that you can feel the pain just by looking at them mm -hmm. so the, the rope burn through the palm of the hand i thought was a good one. Oh, then... that sound oh. this one yummy so close to that daylight too oh if only if only if, if only it were daylight so yeah again that was something that based on on fact or whatever that there's some kinds of phosphorus in rocks that will glow and 
looks a bit like daylight and stuff like that. It's not meant to be daylight. Because at this point, they're like two miles underground or something. So I, I love her understatement of like, I think I hurt my leg. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you see uh, that. At that point, everybody's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I guess like when you're in shock like that, you don't register it immediately. Or maybe you don't yeah. want to acknowledge it. It's so, but I'm not quite sure what's wrong with it. Yeah. I think the, the, actually the act of seeing really makes it hit home. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, I know when when I was in like Boy Scouts and search and rescue and stuff, we were often uh, told, yeah, don't let them look at uh, their their wounds if you can help it. Sometimes yeah. it makes oh. them panic. And, then, uh... <laughs> and uh, yeah, I would point out this, like, although I said, you know, this was all shot on stages. It was shot on stages in January where there's no heating on the stages. Um, and so they, were, so they were absolutely freezing. So And they were constantly being doused in water. So like every time we did a take of this, we'd have to get them off and wrap them in thermal blankets because Nora J. Noon, who was lying in the, the puddle at the beginning mm. with her leg broken, like, you know, shaking with cold. Yeah, it wasn't exactly a pleasant experience for them. Yeah, you don't want them to actually die from hypothermia <laughs> on set while you're making the movie. But I, again, no. like, yeah. as much as I'm sure it was probably quite a miserable experience for them having to do stuff like this, it all adds to the, the it really does, yeah. of it. Oh, yeah, you buy it 100%. Absolute troopers, you know, up to your actors. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, real troopers. So what you can't see very well is the name Oswald written on the helmet. That's an in-joke in all my movies, the Eddie Oswald character from Dog Soldiers. And here, every, every film I've done, there's been an, Os an Eddie Oswald reference. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oswald that ends Oswald. Oh. <laughs> are there are there any spoons oh, no. in this, by any chance? There's no spoons in it, just uh, Oswald. Uh, <laughs> That does not look like a, a fun day out. No. <laughs> There's something about bone for me. That always gets me more than the uh, flesh stuff. This was yeah. not on the brochure. I don't want to ever see my bones. No. You know? <laughs> I'll just... No. Yeah. There's That's a, supposed to be inside me. <laughs> yeah, there's a skeleton in me somewhere, and he could, he could stay there. You know? <laughs> oh, this, this shit is uh, so memorable. The pitch black behind her, perfect. Subtle shimmer of the water. Oh, that's good. Oh, it's so... It's so normal, you know? Like, this is just how it would happen. It's so mundane, in a sense, and that makes it so believable. Yeah, because like, there's not a grand entrance for it or anything. It's just, like, a glimpse of briefly. In <laughs> yeah, the not there. It's kind of it like, goes. we'll just just stumbled yeah. upon its watering hole kind of thing of like you know it's like seeing some creature in the wild yeah it's so uh, unceremonious it's drink. you don't see it for very long either was that something you debated about whether you wanted to hold on it for a little bit longer yes i mean i i didn't want to hold it longer i wanted to add the bare minimum mm -hmm. right i'm going for any kind of a close-up i wanted it to it's her point of view so like it should be at the far end of the torch beam and be kind of obscure it's just enough to register there's something there it looks humanoid it's moving like oh fuck <laughs> And we have all kinds of tensions building between all the characters. And I wanted to have a logic to it as well. It's like, okay, one of the characters thinks that she sees something, but hang on, our other girl is lying here with a broken leg. Yeah. Um, we have to go priority yeah. straight here, and she's the priority, and we got to deal with this first. Yeah, you have to, yeah. like, you know, understand the other characters are dealing with all that blood, the bone, her screaming, and then someone's coming up to them saying, I saw a guy. It's like, I, sure, okay. Sure you <laughs> did, all right. Like, yeah, actually, when, things to deal with right now. Yeah, we're, we're when, all having pointed, a tough day, yeah. As you pointed out earlier, right, listing all of the uh, psychological effects of uh, going down Absolutely. into a really deep cave. Yeah, that uh, people do hallucinate and think they see all kinds of shit in the darkness at the best of times. Get someone off set, just right out of shot, blowing on the candle. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, yeah. I think in the credits he shows up the candle blower. He was, I saw him in the credits. <laughs> he, he did a good job. He did good a good job. job. Yeah. I, I hope he gets more work. I mean, the sound is so good. You know, it, it it's just so believable as a cave because the material you said was like a like a styrofoam sort of thing. So yeah. having the water hit all of the material, it, it really does sound like it's landing on rock. Oh, it just lasts. It's making it so unpleasant for them all the time. <laughs> and here it is. The bone the zone. The bone zone. Ah, jinx. I like how you gave it a name, the bone zone. <laughs> it, is the zo it is the zone of bones. It so makes the most sense. Was there ever a point on set where any of the actors were like, oh, fucking hell, like, this is just shit. Like, I'm really cold and tired and I don't, I, I'm not enjoying myself today. Like, 
Did any of them have um, trouble with it? They didn't actually. Um, I, I don't. I, I didn't hear a complaint from any one of them. Nice. Pretty legendary. Well, they they were all. Good. Yeah, that's impressive. No, they, they were I all think, so committed. I mean, based on what I saw from the behind the scenes <laughs> stuff, it seemed like everyone was so committed and into the project that, you know, it, it's easy, I suppose, if it is miserable work that you know you're working towards making something that really is great. Yeah, uh, everyone and you understands. See the enthusiasm of everyone. It's not like people are. Yeah. As, uh, this is uh, all in favor of some pretty great artwork. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> story behind this one is uh, I think this was probably like fourth or fifth take. It's an amazing jump scare. One of my favorites. So yeah, so, so there is, and it's been like kind of ripped off in a whole bunch of other stuff since then. One of the most notable ones being um, Cloverfield. Literally does it identical with the infrared and the thing in the background behind one of the characters. It's like, uh, yeah. So for that, like, I kept the, the creatures completely hidden from the cast. They didn't even meet the actors playing the creatures. So the first time they ever had an encounter with a crawler, saw what it looked like. We never, they never saw the designs. They never saw anything. Was in that shot on the first take of that shot, and it was a, it was a fun idea to do because it really built up tension on set. Oh yeah, within the performances. But on the first take, they literally just ran screaming off the set. They, 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 That's they, not even acting them. there. It's <laughs> an actual genuine yeah. terror. <laughs> yeah. But also on the first maybe four takes of it, I had the crawler like reaching toward her, and it just something about it just didn't look right. It just didn't look scary. And I just said, just don't reach to her, just stand there with like your head tilted as if you're kind of listening or something like that and that's the one we use because it just looks so freaky that like he's just standing there behind her doing nothing and then the they sound effects and, then... <laughs> and it's all practical it's all practical blood oh it looks bloody brilliant that's why it looks so good so something that happens there is she's screaming and then the scream turns into like a blood curdled scream <laughs> I want to understand that yeah. was the actress's idea because that's a really great addition. The fact that the blood would have gone into her throat and so it would have changed yeah. the way the scream totally. sounds. Scream, yeah. And all the actors playing the crawlers, they're very acrobatic almost, but in an animalistic kind of way. It's not like Cirque du Soleil. It's more like a like a spider hopping around or a like a like a like a creature, uh, you this, know, a nimble the, creature. Um... We did a lot of rehearsal with the actors playing the crawlers and modeling themselves on spider movements was really, it was very much a part of the character at the beginning was oh, okay. I look, how spiders move, how they, they, they're very still and then suddenly they scuttle and they're really yeah. fast and then they go still again. And I just thought that, yeah, that was, like a, no was a way of moving was just <laughs> really fucking creepy. Um, I love the light in here as well. Don't overexpose yeah. the... Uh... The creatures the low and this, light and this, and this, by the this, shadows this fight scene was like completely unchoreographed i basically said the crawler was like your job is to try and bite her throat your job is to stop him go <laughs> <laughs> act go it just feels brutal just, yeah absolutely felt it does. so yeah. felt so much more raw and organic yeah messy in a way it's just uh yeah there's uh... no Oh, tragic. So this, this was this, so this is one of those moments where I really like playing with the Juno character of like everybody else has run for their lives. Juno's there. She's fighting this fucker and she's being really heroic. And you're like, yes, go Juno, go Juno. And then suddenly that happens. It's like, fuck. <laughs> and look at the actress. They're both yeah. phenomenal here. <laughs> well, that's going to be important later. Yeah. And just the way that it all arises in the middle of this really intense fight this brutal fight and then you know like while well, she's still caught up essentially in that chaos and not really yeah, how do you deal like, with this not really grasping herself that this happens and, and yeah what do you do yeah because it's the thing you don't see too often in movies like that friendly fire aspect of it like in the middle of a chaotic battle you could quite easily end up nailing one of your friends by accident just because it's so yeah, um, you can't see properly. Part of what's so admirable at the like opening of it is she's trying to defend the body. That's yeah, her she's goal. To... And their objective is body just to body. drag it away so they can eat it. You know, yeah. That's all they're after. So you're so with her and then you're like, oh no. <laughs> like... And she backs off into the shadows. Yeah. So our teams are split in three. So yeah, so then it became a challenge of like, well, how do we know who we're with? So mm. it was the idea, well, well, we'll give these the green slap, snap light so that we know anytime we're green, we're with these two. And then the one is fire. Well, Sarah becomes fire after she does the video camera thing. And then it's a case of like, well, where can we hide the creatures? <laughs> Yeah, it gives you the impression they can always be around. Just waiting, lurking. Like you don't get that safe feeling you're very much you know on edge and there's tension and yeah and you're tension. you're you're on their turf now yeah 
very much on you that really staff. do get that sense i mean we, it's been so long since we've been outside it seems like this is just the world now that was actually another note from one of the one of the producers or the producer when writing it was like he, i think he got to about this stage in the script he was like we need some scene outside the cave we need to give the audience a break and my response was like absolutely not <laughs> like <laughs> you're not spielberg didn't let the audience off the boat at jaws you know once they're on the, the orca they're on the orca we don't get off the boat in alien you don't get to escape to a scene outside the nostromo it's like you're in it so i was like no we keep them in there with them yeah, all the time no this is no what relief. they are experiencing right yeah and what are you going to cut to I mean, yeah, like some guys <laughs> in a control room, like trying to mount a rescue mission for or a happy or dog. Unironically, yeah. yes, that's what a lot of movies would do. They would yeah. have the team up top who's looking for him so that every few minutes, oh, it's your nice to be up here in the sunshine again. Oh, we wouldn't want anyone to get stressed out. My objective by, by this point of the, of the film was like, it's just going to punish the audience from now on. It's going to get more and more relentless. So that slow build pay off would be worth it be ready for it because we didn't go all the way to 11 in the first five minutes of the film and we save it for the last 45 minutes of the film or the last 40 minutes of the film where it just goes ape shit. well that's another thing i think this film achieves very well is that no one feels protected nothing feels safe any one of them could go at any time bring that somebody like beth or whatever could end up getting a pickaxe through her neck randomly is just like okay everybody's expendable here was there anything to having um particular colors per the groups or did this sort of just Take out this way. The choice of colors was not specific, only that they did have some defining color a group, or mm -hmm. at least this one. Um, but you know, green, it could have been blue, but I think this green feels a bit more, you know, icky compared to the red. Oh, look Standard at that. blue like color, you know, pretty believable. My read on the color scheme is that the reason why Sarah's is red is so dominant is like the descent essentially into madness, like into the depths of like psychological hell in a sense. Meanwhile, the other group and when Juno rejoins them is green because she's sort of on a path to potential redemption. Like as she becomes yeah. more uh, heroic and more of a fighter. That's, that's my read of the color scheme and I really like it uh, as an idea. Also with blue would have suggested daylight. So I didn't want to suggest any kind of daylight, so... Oh, right, interesting. Well, yeah, because green is not a particularly common light lighting color, you know? I feel like I should probably mention it, too. The crawlers look fucking great. They really mm -hmm. do. We um, haven't mentioned it. Probably good creature just, design. It seems so good. You Fantastic kind of, design. Look, they've, they've just got enough human elements so you can see, like, well, okay, I can see what they began as, and this is what they've devolved into because they're in a cave they can't see, you know, the, it's dark all the time. Like, you understand how they function pretty quickly. What were your uh, main inspirations for the designs? Uh, it's the things like the Master from Salem's Lot and obviously Nosferatu. Mm -hmm. um, oh, like I can that. see that a lot, yeah. That pale skin, um, but, the but ears. Trying to, the, the pale skin, the ears. was also trying to figure out, well, okay, if we're making them, they're going to be blind. And Paul Hyatt came up with this, who designed the creatures, came up with this idea of like, Almost looking like their eyes were beginning to kind of seal up. Not only are they blind, but they're, mm. you know, it's like they're evolving so that they won't actually have eyes in a few generations' time. And uh, their, their ears were bigger, like bat ears, more carnivorous, I guess, with their teeth. But, uh, you know, th there's not a huge amount of prosthetics to them. A lot of it's body paint and a lot of KY jelly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the actors did bloody great. They seem so committed. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, yeah, well, the I mean, they yeah, move. they were they're essentially like wandering around naked with these little pouches glued to their fronts to cover them up. So, yeah, they were committed and brave. I think in one of the commentaries, you'd mentioned that you shot the crawlers differently. Yeah, they were all shot at 18 frames a second at a 45 degree shutter to give them a more staccato kind of look. Mm. Okay. Them look Interesting. Kind of fast and jerky. All right. It's crazy. Cause that spider life. Because you can like see it. But it's tough to tell like what it is, but you can see it. There's just something Sense off about that, them. Uh, there's something about them, yeah. Almost harder to understand, which increases the fear factor as well. Mm. Uh, Evidence of the uh, miners. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Here in the pit, this is where it would be. Makes sense. I just wanted this to be really rancid, just all the mm. corpses and things lying there. It reminded me a bit like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, with you know the house that just has skeletons and bones everywhere and bits of flesh and flies stuff like that. This is that was one of the scenes where we had to cheat a little bit because we just didn't have a light source. It's a really difficult problem to solve. It's, it, you've chosen one of the most difficult places in the world to solve that problem. So I think you did a yeah. brilliant job. So much of the other lighting was literally like just off, just off screen. There is somebody standing with like a little reflector board, so that basically her own torch is bouncing back into her face. That's it. Not overly intense. Yeah. 
keeps kind of the color of the light. That's a, that's a prosthetic body, right? That's not actually the actress. Yeah, we mix and match. There's like one shot there of the real actress, and then the rest is the prosthetic body. Really impressive work again. Sometimes you get surprised with what can be pulled off. Special effects. It was so realistic, and at the end of the film, presented her with her own head. It's <laughs> um, a keepsake, and she took it home, and she hid it in her mom's fridge. Oh. <laughs> no. Brilliant. Brilliant. No. And then, like, hid behind the curtains or something, waiting for her mom to come home and open the fridge. I thought that was genius. <laughs> <laughs> her mom was never the same after that. No. Never, never forgiven her. <laughs> Look at this resourceful. Yep. Remember when characters were smart and made, like, clever decisions? Especially within their own skill yeah. sets, too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. This isn't, like, an unbelievable sort of thing. It's, you know, all right, I got some oil, I got this thing. All right, you know. Yeah, I was believable. trying to come up with like the the tools that would enable this to happen, but I also wanted to get back to built primal stuff of like fire, yeah, and fire in caves, and it just makes it very primal. I like that because Sarah's regression or descent or whatever it is, like she becomes very primal. Yeah, from a more the civilized sort of state to more a bit more barbaric and animalistic, savage. I guess. Yes, savage. And this is just one of those takes where it's like, okay, well, let's just keep it running and running. And, oh, is there something there? No. Where's it going to come from? I Go. think you assume that safe? when you return, that that's when it'll turn up. And then it doesn't. You're like, oh, right, are we safe? <laughs> and it's like, hmm. No, oh, you're never safe. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Marg. Nice and quiet. Until. And, yeah, maybe we showed one earlier that was just lurking on the wall up top, just waiting. So... Yeah, there's just no, there's no beauty to any of it. It's just so animalistic, and they're trying to get each other. I love how she's just gone into full-on <laughs> fucking combat mode. Oh, it makes it so hard yeah. not to like her. <laughs> well, yeah. we saw her face in that previous scene. Just you know, the actress did such a good job that, you know, all right, it's kill mode now. We're well, yeah, yeah transition yeah. from panic to steely determination. Yeah. Well, because it's like you just have to imagine what's going through her head. Is like I can be scared or. I can live, which requires me to be strong. That's going to have to be what I have to do. Yeah. What I love as well is, like, obviously we've established throughout this, like, these things can be beaten individually. Mm -hmm. Like, they're not this invincible supernatural threat that, like, is uh, just... Yeah, that always will. annoys me. Things that are inexplicably, yeah. like, bulletproof or something. Yeah, oh, I hate bulletproof, like, yeah. These are, uh, these are just very much flesh and blood creatures that can be killed like anything else. And, like, yeah. they have weapons. They can defend themselves if they all work together and stick together. You can fuck them up, but they can fuck you up. Yep. So be careful. Yeah, in case it makes it more of an even match. Just because, you know, a bunch of women going down a cave, they're not taking guns with them or anything. They've exactly, got, yeah. They've got what they've got. I'm really interested in how taking regular people and stripping away society and all that kind of stuff to see how primal and savage it will become and to survive I, that, that mm -hmm. fascinates me mm -hmm. yeah you hear all those stories about people trapped in places or stuck on islands or, or raised by wolves. Know, things people do yeah i was raised by wolves actually mm. uh, yeah they're nice they're really nice you get to know them it just it's so relatable hearing them talk like everyone's just like normal they say things that you would expect people to say they don't have these harebrained schemes or jump to these wild conclusions one of them isn't a random rocket scientist who builds a teleporter out of rocks and bones <laughs> it's so grounded and believable the most that they have is a doctor or a, or a medical student but mm. like you know what, she, what the hell does she know about underground creatures it's like she gives it a best shot well that I scene there was probably I... the closest we got to like a reprieve I think that's reasonable. Like, it's a yeah. gasp of air. Oh, yeah, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, because this scene is not friendly. Yeah. This was kind of rough to shoot this one. <laughs> a lot of credit goes to the guys who made all the bones and the gunk and the gore bits that are just laying around. It looks so, I mean, the way that it's textured and it looks wet and it looks, you know, you have the furry bits and the antlers. It looks so good. A lot of animal bits, antlers and stuff. It's, it's like, it's not just the seriously important character stuff is happening. It's that the audience gets to feel like she was thrown in with a bunch of flesh and bone as like, you know, to be trashed yep. or kept ready to eat. Horrifying. Did yeah. you use any, um... Did you use any real animal bones or skeleton bits? It's entirely possible. I'm not 100 percent sure, <laughs> but uh, okay. Uh, they wouldn't. Have, they wouldn't. Have, it might have been bones. It wouldn't have been no actual bits. dead deer <laughs> corpses that you had them. Um, yeah, they tend to go very stinky under the the, the lights. Mm. You know, I well. would imagine. I mean, the first deer on the the top that we saw before they got in the cave that was all a a fake one that had been put together, and that looked great. Was yeah. Uh, Paul Hyatt, the makeup effects supervisor, he, he couldn't come in that day because uh, we covered the dead deer with maggots and he has this complete phobia of maggots. 
Uh, yeah, maggots are. Anyone near Ugh. the maggots? I can't do that. I can't do that. And yeah, no. this is an unfortunate but very realistic result of what's happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, I was just like, you know, the more I think about this concept of like, you know, you got to stove your best friend's head in with a rock in order to put her out of her misery. It's like, what does it take to do that? Yeah, I mean, you know, this how, is... how's, how does that affect you? The most you can ask of a friend, I'd say. Yeah, then this notion that, you know, somehow if she escapes, she's going to be all right after this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Pulling back so that Obviously. we don't see the grisly details. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Because that, that was one of those ones where I was like, this isn't about seeing gore. It isn't about yeah. anything else. It's all about the emotion. And it's like, mm -hmm. uh, let's just give her a moment and then we'll do something else quickly. That lighter um, like voice, it's higher pitched and the smaller size, yeah. God, you don't look half fucking terrifying as well, though. So that was the the kid playing that crawler was um, the same kid he played a little zombie in Twenty Eight Days Later. Oh, cool. Also got his head stoved in. <laughs> <laughs> He's good at it. Interesting childhood yeah. he had. Play your strengths. And you know, obviously, this is the reveal that not only is there baby crawlers, but there's female crawlers, and it's a whole society. And then, and of course, she's just killed the child of the mother. Mm. Plays Here on a whole is. other level with her that, character. That is. Properly, like this is like the sump of the entire cave, isn't it? Like all the the blood and guts and everything just drained down into the, here. This was all the crap. The uh, most there. significant memory I had of the film after I'd first seen it when it came out, because I was pretty young, and this this shot I never forgot it. Man, this is uh, this is iconic. This is a this is an iconic horror shot for cinema. And what's it's cool? It's just so. It's, uh, I assume reminiscent of a certain other movie. And yet, it's uh, you oh, managed yeah. to sort of, I'd say, Fine. using inspiration, create your own very iconic shot. Two thousand one, a space odyssey. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Very reminiscent. <laughs> of, yeah. Oh, I love it. It's just the flame lights flickering, the red on no. everything. It's oh. How oh, much blood? It's absolutely bloody blood. disgusting and yet amazing. I mean, this is this is like the most hellish. It looks beautiful. Sort right? of. Yeah. It really does in that creepy, gory beautiful. way. It looks like you're in the depths of a hell pit. A literal baptism in blood. And her and Juno going uh, kind of similar journeys in opposite directions in a sense. Like, Juno saves friends while doing it. She's, like, covered in blood in the easting stomach pool with the, the lady who's angry at her. She killed its son, probably, uh, that having to deal with. You know what I mean? It just feels much more grimy. Yeah. Even the, just like this... Oh, I love flat it. expression, right? Like she's already sort of uh, acclimating and adapting to this situation in a way that she's uh, got to do. <laughs> I love how you got the drool just landing on her yeah. head there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kicking her in the head was accidental, but I was like, "Oh, that works. That looks good." See, after shooting this scene, you would have to spend hours in the shower trying to get all yeah. this shit off you. Yeah, I think she had a bit of a pink glow after this one. A fire and a club. Well, that, that is a bit. That, that is a bit like two thousand and one, picking up the bone and using it as a club. So. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Reject modernity. We just we just need to have the the soundtrack in the back as she clubs it, <laughs> throws the bone in the air in slow mo. There's a really subtle but interesting sound cut there. She screams at the top of her lungs, and then it cuts to them. The sound that you can hear is a crawler screaming, not her. <laughs> Mm. Ah. Whatever that means. Is she you know, becoming could, like the crawlers? Is it just a coincidence? Is that what you need to become to survive here? That notion that if the crawlers don't exist and they're just a figment of her imagination, is she the one who's actually going around killing you know, the other girls? And is she essentially the crawler in her own mind? Again, I, I'm leaving it open to interpretation. I don't know if that's... Is that right or wrong? Who knows? But now she's seen a bunch of crawlers, so... Yeah. A little bit terrifying. A little bit. <laughs> Is there oh, one of the most crowded? The most, yeah, this is yeah, the most all once. Yeah, well, it just gives you a big sense that, good God, they're everywhere. Yeah. Before yeah. this point, you could almost hop hypothesize. Maybe there's only just a couple. Maybe there's not that many. But no, there's a lot. Yeah, of, yeah. So we started to build them up in groups, understand um, how many there were. Yeah, and this scene, I think, is much stronger when you have that, uh, the length of the prior one, how difficult this is to do. You don't have gloves either. Gotta keep moving. Oh, so. Yeah, that looks Oops. really fucking hard. And also just that it was her sister who did it first time around. Now she's taking yeah. on the task herself. Also this shot. And this, is, this, this originated 
Yeah, this originated from a, a, the story I heard about a climber in the 70s. I think he's a Scots climber called Joe Brown. Who went across the roof of a cave using these cracks where he'd like stick his hand in and clench his fist stop it from coming back out again and so he could hang from his, his fist like that wow. which is clearly going to like destroy your hand so i thought well, that's a really interesting kind of idea for for this beat was just ripping her own because she's a doctor or whatever and like ripping her hands to shreds and i think the drama of this situation makes uh, a lot of people including the audience forget it's like you have a horde behind you by the way they're coming yeah and playing i had fun playing around with the whole upside down bit with this scene as well and in order to achieve one of these, these the, the blood effect at the end of this sequence, it was like, you come up with a solution for her falling on it, you know, how do we have this a massive amount of blood that's going to come out and only, like, start pouring out when she falls backwards? To which I managed to come up with a solution, which was to get, basically get, like, a hot water bottle, fill it full of blood, and stick it down her top. Oh. So that when she fell back, it all just came pouring out. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it, it looks works. great. <laughs> And it's not just the blood, just the the way the camera moves. Oh, the, ugh. Yeah. The way oh, that yeah. Shot the fingernail. Just, ugh. Oh, and they just get right in. I left but to jump. Um, and this was actually a, a pickup when we were in the edit. We were like. Can we get another little beat in there? So we went back and we shot this underwater sequence just to add another little bit of like, to just make it relentless at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it really does feel like at this point, this movie is not going to let up. No. Certainly a way of watching with audience for the first time of like the sense of like, oh my God, it just keeps on, they keep on hitting us again and again and again. Were you hoping at this point to get uh, Juno having gone fully into water while Sarah's gone fully into like a blood swamp? Feels, uh, an interesting comparison, a contrast between the two of them at this point in the story. Um, it wasn't conscious. It was just I, I needed, you know, I needed to have a jump to the cliff to survive. And it was like, well, all this water we're seeing throughout the movie, it's all going to be gathering somewhere. So I think it makes for an interesting, like, uh, civilization aspect, right, of uh, Sarah's life being stripped down to cave woman mode. Meanwhile, Juno is still very recognizable, especially after being cleaned up from having gone into the water as just rock climber girl trying to survive this whole situation. So their square off feels that much more. Yeah. Contrast and, is. and the, con the contrast is certainly apparent here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There has been Sarah's through some stuff. Oh, full savage. <laughs> you want to jump in the water? It's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thematically and just the aesthetic here, just showing what these, she's been through and what she's becoming, it's pretty very direct for a very direct sort of change that I think is very appropriate. It's not oh, so and... subtle at this point, which is the point. Or, uh, undoing. And, uh, yeah, obviously she wanted to, to test Juno about Beth's death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I suppose there's an irony if Juno had been more honest, she might have lived. Yeah, and, uh, you know, and after all, Beth's death was an accident. It was, yeah. It was yeah. just the fact that she lies about she died, but then, you know. But the problem is it's just there's yeah, a any lack of information. Would be happy with. Juno wasn't yeah, around. Not really, it's, no one's going to stop and make explanations at this point. <laughs> no, and, and it, I imagine for Juno, she'd be like, how the hell am I going to explain what happened? It, it makes me sound like an asshole either way, right? Yeah. But obviously yeah. Sarah interprets that as the worst version, which is that she would have wounded Beth and left her as bait. Yeah, protect herself. Yeah, which, I mean, is viable, uh, unfortunately. What a desperate The way situation. they're so still. I love yeah. how they're so still, like they're just waiting. We ended up, in the shooting schedule, I think we ended up with like half a day to shoot this fight sequence. It's not. There was a chance to get down and dirty and brutal up again. And I mean, yeah. and looking at the characters, it does, like, so many films nowadays, they try to pretty, particularly women, they try to pretty them up all the time in between shots, do their hair, get their makeup all, uh, all right and sorted out so they look lovely. And, like, they're models, even if in the movie they've been fighting and running around and exerting themselves. But in this movie, you really feel like they've been through so much. They look so different by the end. They're worn uh, and yeah. dirty and... Oh, I love how she's playing them, though. <laughs> yeah. That's where she's it's, at now yeah, as a character. It was definitely time to get down and dirty, biting and smashing heads in and thumbs in the eyes and anything goes, really. Absolutely not. <laughs> I think something you said on uh, the making of was that it was kind of a deliberate choice to have you know, is yelling and screaming and doing all kinds of verbiage throughout while uh, Sarah's basically silent. Very measured, yeah. Like the bit where she wipes her thumb. <laughs> yeah, like, good as yeah. new. All that eye gunk. What marvelous restraint you had to not have a line here. 
<laughs> you killed her, didn't you? I will make you pay. <laughs> Then she looks the big, at the the big inspiration was um, was Last of the Mohicans. I loved oh, I loved yeah. the ending of Last of the Mohicans, where like there's no dialogue, just like the 15 minutes at the end of the movie. It's just everything is just explained to action, and I was just like, how can I do that? A little smirk there. Yeah, I mean, this the thing is the shot where she raises it up like she just looks mad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's they tragic, are obviously isn't it? like uh, obviously there's some like heavily heavy sort of carry reference going on. Yeah? Oh yeah, yeah. What a what a tragic end ever. I think even then Juno still goes out like an absolute boss. Yeah, she's ready to fucking like, keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I can do this all day. And I guess um, obviously the the producers or whatever figured that that's, since we don't see her die, I think it's possible. So that's how she comes back for the sequel. Oh my god, Descent Two, Juno, <laughs> Juno's Revenge, a Juno story. Descent Two, great <laughs> computer yeah. game. I don't know how well you remember Descent Part Two, but like the only physical evidence that she went through that battle is apparently she's lost her pants. But um, they decided to put her in shorts in the sequel. Well, if you're uh, again, if you're happy to, I was actually going to ask you about Descent Part Two. I haven't actually seen it. I haven't yet either. No, me either. Well, I when, honestly didn't even know it existed. <laughs> when I found out you hadn't written or directed it, I was a little bit skeptical. I'm just going to put it that way. Yeah, I at the beginning it was like you know, they were going to do it anyway because they had the rights to do it and they didn't need my permission to do it, so they wanted to do it anyway. So initially, I did, I did get involved with trying to guide it in the right direction, but uh, a lot of ideas were rejected and they just carried on doing it anyway so it was like okay you're just going to do your own thing and one of those things is bringing back juno and putting her in a pair of shorts to make her look more sexy or something i don't know uh, she wasn't sexy enough before exactly, you say <laughs> that was exactly the kind of stuff i was fighting against on this film because yeah. there was a suggestion at one point was like we have a scene where they all arrive at this pool of water and they all strip naked and go for a swim i'm like are you fucking kidding me? Like, what <laughs> film are you making? Did you guys even see the first movie? Did you understand what it was or anything? <laughs> uh, that, this, that, was, that, that was for the first movie. That was for this They movie. wanted it in this oh, movie. Right. Okay. Oh my god. Jesus. You guys have... So one, of the, like, one of the producers suggested that. And I said, look, if that's the movie you want to make, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll leave now. Because that, that's not the movie I'm making. Oh, if you can't tell that. the vibe. Oh, it would have ruined it. Oh, it's so yeah, silly. Yeah. It would have taken us right out of it. And they have money. They can make a porno if they want to. Didn't mean to over talk, by the way. The shots you had of her climbing yeah. there were phenomenal. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Climbing Super out, iconic. Do you have a flattered. favorite shot? Do I have a favorite shot in the whole film? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, but that one of her climbing up the, the, the ladder sort of thing there is, is one of the best. It's beautiful. Yeah. And now there's a few close ups of, that I really like at the end there and that confrontation. The two shots of the girls look. Hmm. Amazing, um, but it's a beautiful film. That's the thing. I think it's um, it doesn't get enough credit for uh, Sam McCurdy who shot it of just how beautiful it really looks. The cinematography you know, the, throughout the cinema is just incredible. incredible. It was all shot in thirty five mil. It looks like uh, it's got a texture to it, and it really owes itself well to those. You know, the brutality of the scenes and the texture of the caves as well. It's very complimentary. You no, know, yeah, it's on Blu Ray and stuff like that, so it looks looks gorgeous. Yeah, it's been a rough day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in the American cut, to end the movies. that was Great. the end. So in the American cut, that was the end. Her, the close-up on her eyes, cut to end credits. It's not my fault. Uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame me. <laughs> we made her eyes extra blue on this one as well. So there's six candles on there. Yeah. As opposed to five, yeah. So, what is that like then? Do they do they come to you and say like, I don't like but she's still in the cave. I think you should make it so that she's not. That's sort of like explicit, or is it something else? Um, Lionsgate did some test screenings, and they said, we've had an idea. We've test screened it twice. But yeah, With the original ending, we got these results, and with the cut ending, we got these results, which were noticeably better. They basically said, like, if you let us cut the last 30 seconds of the, fir seconds of the film, we'll give it like a 3,000 screen release. If you don't, we'll give it like a 1,000 screen release. And oh, I don't know whether they... They, I don't know whether they really meant that or not, but we were like, uh, fuck it. Because by this point, it was like a year after the film had come out in the UK and the rest of the world. We were like, oh, yeah, do, do, you know, for, for the big release, go for it. Anybody who wants to see the original version will be able to. It'll be there. And they can get on Amazon and order it from the UK if they want to. 
But as it turned out, the version came out as the unrated version. And I think that's kind of the only version you can get in the US now is the unrated version. So, so in the end, it's okay. We, we got the it's full okay. The arc, the arc of history yeah. is long, but it bends towards justice. Because, yes. Yeah, I, f I feel like the extended ending, I don't even like to call like that. that feels to me the, the, the proper ending. True yeah. ending for the film. Yeah. It, it strikes me as, you know, her getting out of the cave, it just seems like a little too easy. And then it brings us back to reality, which is she's descended into madness which is the expected outcome of this excursion absolutely i mean it's just so much more interesting and so much more to talk about it's so much it, it i just think it adds and you know what i mean it makes it a distinctive ending an if ending you, that really sets it apart there's so many interpretations if you desperately need it in your own head that she escapes you could take it as she did escape but that in her mind she's still um, in the cave yeah could go that direction yeah, yeah. absolutely if you, if you like. I mean, it's open to interpretations, which I like, but I think for, also for me, it was like, I wanted to just give the audience that final kick in the teeth of like, oh, she's vomited, and then she's seen her friend, and oh, fuck, actually back in the cave. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. it fits with the whole theme, <laughs> I guess, of this movie of just never letting up, and never letting you go, never giving you that moment to breathe, and letting you uh, like, even if there's a, a few seconds of, uh, of quiet, it's like straight away there's another thing, and it's, uh, it's just a perfect way to end it, I think. Just that, that gradual descent into just um, loss of all hope, I mm -hmm. suppose. It fits with the traumatic past of the character. And yeah, it's, it just it sits nicely with how the, the movie's tone is. I want to argue um, too, it's kind of set up. Because you have a lot of moments in the film, just like when she wakes up in the hospital, when the pole comes through the, the window, that they are, you believe and she believes that she's in the real world, and then she wakes up to realize, oh, I'm not. And so it's it's an interesting flip that at the end, something, quote unquote, good is happening, but that if you've been paying attention, she does hallucinate. So you're like, it does. you know, it's almost waiting for the other shoe to drop. You're like, uh-oh, is this real? The other thing I really appreciate about this film, like, its runtime is, what, 90 minutes? Or thereabouts? Thereabouts, yeah. Uh, there's... I think. There's there's so much hour, in it for the length of time that it runs. Like there's so much in it. There's so like all the characters feel like properly fleshed out. There's great arcs for everyone. Plenty of action. Plenty of, of mystery to unravel. And it's all crammed into this really condensed runtime. But it never feels rushed. I just think but that's the, great. No superfluous scenes. Every scene serves a purpose. It builds character. It builds tension. Yep. Builds and theme. Like, and like we said, you know, the, the Krogers don't really show up until about 45 minutes into it. And so mm -hmm. you got all of that time. And yet still, it, it doesn't feel rushed once they arrive. Really impressive, the pacing of it. Mm. And I was really happy with the pacing of it. I think, I, yeah, it did, it did work out pretty well. And you still, you know, it's still at 45 minutes worth of crawler action. It's like you still get to know it's about the crawlers and their society, their culture, and a lot, of, a lot of visual information in there. What a wonderful, wonderfully timed movie, wonderfully paced, excellent in terms of how it stands the test of time, the practicality of it holds up so well uh and there's there's layers of things to talk about so many horror movies are just oh yeah the monster came and it, it killed the lady it bit her head off and it was cool but well this the, definitely has those layers of character and subtext and you know a journey happening so many tropes to avoid right like this one character walks off on her own in a distant area gets killed and then they're all like oh. it's like i need a pee goes off on her own gets killed and you're like okay <laughs> if you want to do it that way i guess they're, they're all <laughs> relatively intelligent they're all relatively resourceful but within limits, like practical limits, they feel like real people and they make generally pretty good decisions throughout the film. Yeah. Most yeah, of the time, yeah. Like, I mean, they obviously get I really didn't want to do this. Things, but... Yeah, I really didn't want to have the characters acting really stupid and have that whole, you know, why don't you all wait here while I'm going to go and explore that down here and then get killed kind of thing. So there's one beat where Hera goes to, she hears a daughter, or what sounds like a daughter. <laughs> And goes to explore that but it doesn't result in anybody getting killed yeah and it's the it's kind of interesting to think about in retrospect that when they first attacked they all sort of run off in different directions kind of and while if they'd stayed you know together used their light effectively they might have been able to make it out or at least survive a little longer but that's the nature of this mm. experience you're not yeah, the you're panic. panicking yeah it happened so yeah. quick and it shot so, in such a way that it really conveys that panic and the, the frenetic quickness of everything just, you know, shit hitting the fans so quickly that you don't really blame them for not being so rational in those moments. I, see, I mean, it's an authentic reaction, so. Oh, yeah. It, oh, it shows. And again, just a, a, more praise on that, that particular thing, because it's just such a surprise to have uh, one of the girls be able to take one of them out and immediately have her take out one of her own friends. 
You'll see it very often, because the goal, of course, from a filmmaking perspective would be to endear everyone to that character, and if she's killed one, you're like, well, maybe she'll kill more, maybe she'll be our warrior character, but now you're conflicted, because you're like, that's just happened, now what do I feel about it? What do I feel about oh. the whole event, and how is it going to move on? And you just, like I said, you just don't see that enough. Um, in the same way that you don't see bleak endings enough, and they can create a lot of really raw experiences as a moviegoer, but of course, you could, as you've said, you can get discouraged to do that when you get test screen reactions that they prefer to have the happier endings. Yeah, it was, it's it's interesting um, of late because I, I remember hearing a couple of weeks ago, whatever, like first reactions to Oppenheimer and people saying that hey, people are going to walk out of the screening depressed or shell shocked or whatever. And my initial reaction to all that was like, great, I can't <laughs> wait to see this film because it's, I might actually come out feeling something as opposed to nothing, which just seems to be the, the you know, very common of like is everything's so bland. It's like, great, something that actually might stir some emotions in me, whatever they may be. I don't mind if it's yeah. negative, but at least it, it's something. Yeah, there's so many bland, empty movies out there that are just this tasteless sludge, you know, that, you know, hey, I, I just want to feel something, damn it. With this film, did you feel in, in relation to Descent 2 that this was a one and done sort of situation? The story was told? Yeah, as far as I was concerned, it was like, that's it. There's nowhere else to take the story. It's like, Sarah's trapped down there. She's going to die. Juno's dead. There's nowhere to go. Yeah. Um, it was a case of like, well, this is a success. Let's see if we can cash in on it and make some more. And, uh, but the motivation for the producers to do that and how they did it was just like such a mess. It's like, you know, and their thinking was, all that matters is that we get some characters into the cave. Once we're into the cave, it doesn't matter what happens. It's like, that's all people want to see. Like, do you not learn anything from what from the experience of making the first film? Do you not even talk to audiences about it? It's like, uh, it just seems such a dumb response of like, you know, audiences don't care. They just want to get into the cave and see the monsters. Yeah, you missed everything, really. What's interesting, if you do watch the second one, it's interesting that it actually, it doesn't pick up from either ending. It, it makes doesn't pick up from something. the kind of starts. I haven't seen it in a long time. But like Sarah suddenly like emerges from a lake. Um, okay. There, there, there was a notion that uh, picking up from the UK ending that she jumps off the the ledge and ends up into the water and then gets washed out of the cave somehow and then that's how she ends up in a lake. But they never shot that first part, so she just literally like emerges out of a lake. It's so so it doesn't it's so daft. Like there's nothing about this movie that would make me think I want to see another one or I want to see a continuation of this story. It's a it's a wrapped up, finished, complete narrative. Like, it's there's almost just nothing as, there that I'd yeah. want to pick up. It's almost as crazy as making like some that's kind it. of weird sequel yeah. to the thing, you know? And then starring... Exactly. The thing's a good example of seven. Imagine a sequel to Seven. Like, where's it going to go? Well, at eight. least they didn't actually make a sequel to Seven called Eight or something. <laughs> eight. <laughs> yeah. Eight. But uh, unfortunately, the thing did get a they sequel called prequel. It seven two. <laughs> seven, seven two. Seven two. Seven and a half. Oh, it's a musical. Um, <laughs> one two. Yeah, well, I suppose the thing did get the prequel as opposed to the it sequel. It did, yeah. Which, you know what, I struggle to have a strong hatred for just because when you find out they did all the practical effects and then they got sort of CG'd over, you feel bad oh, for the team tragedy. behind it. Yeah. Tragedy. Yeah, it's a tragedy. tragedy. I feel bad for, the, bad for the team, but I also feel bad for the fact that like, they, they seriously, they couldn't come up with a title for it. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Let's just also call it the thing. <laughs> You should have called the, it uh, things, things, or, yeah, or the other thing, <laughs> the other thing, yeah, <laughs> the thing from the, the before thing. the thing, <laughs> the first thing. They should have called it stuff, stuff. <laughs> well, I, th I think that was the era of soft reboots and things, just having the same name as the first thing, like yeah. Tomb Raider. I mean, the, the the idea is inherently lazy anyway. But if you're so fucking lazy, you could you can't think of anything better than to just use the same title, just to cause confusion in later years. It's like, which one are we talking about here? What will happen in culture is that people will forget one of them. Usually, not the classic that they forget. Huh? Mm. How about that? How about mm. that? Mm. However, could that be? Mm. You have a uh, sort of a favorite production memory. My favorite thing was the fact that we shot it very much in story order. Once we got into the studio, so we did the location stuff first, then we got into the studio and we pretty much shot the whole thing exactly in story order. And so every time a character got killed, we were wrapping that cast member so that literally like, they'd stagger off the set having been brutally killed, come <laughs> off the set covered in blood and be given a bunch of flowers and it'd be like, you know, the, the, it's a wrap on that, that actor. And then we wouldn't see them again until we whittled it down to literally it was just Sarah. On a, and then on the very, very last day, because the, so the last shot of the movie, it was the last shot that we shot on the last day. 
That's actually happened quite a lot on some of my films. So that, that shot of her on, on you know, with the, the cake and the, the girl you know, was the last shot that we shot. And what happened was because like, everybody was just so environment, the family kind of nature that we created was that for the last day, all of the cast came back and hung around all day and were there for the last scene or last shot. And so it was just it was just great. It was just a really magical little moment um, to call a wrap on the film after getting that shot. But did you do when you were making it? Like the, this was going to turn out to be one of the best horror movies of all time? <laughs> I had no idea. No idea. I mean, think, you know, we knew the script was pretty good and it was starting to come together visually pretty well, but I had no idea how it was going to be received. Well, I hope you know you made something pretty special. Uh, you really, really did. did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm immensely proud of it. Immensely proud of it. Good. You should be. This is so much It, it really is. It's so one much. of the best horror movies. One of the best horror movies ever made. Yeah, unironically. Thanks to whoever it was who made that review of Dog Soldiers and inspired <laughs> him to whoever you are out there. Good job. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Watching all the behind-the-scenes stuff and the, the commentaries, it really seemed like you had a fun time. You know, obviously, movies are hard work to make. You know that more than anyone, uh, but there seemed to be some absolutely, camaraderie. But, but it's interesting, and you, you can see it on the behind-the-scenes footage that we actually had a lot of fun making it, weirdly, given its dark subject matter. Now, I keep on trying to explain this to people who don't believe me, that, that making horror films is actually a lot of fun and there tends mm. to be a lot of laughs behind the scenes, mm. no matter how dark you get in front of the camera. That was, as soon as the blood starts flying around or whatever, it's, it's kind of child's play sometimes, and it's just it's a lot of fun. Now, the people who make horror films are some of the like the loveliest people that I've ever met in the industry. You know, the, the kindest, nicest people, the, the, you know, the Stuart Gordons and the Mick Garrises and the uh, Wes Cravens of this world are like really, really nice people. You know, In our line of work, we, we end up seeing a lot of the production behind the scenes stuff to essentially review films and everything just to make sure we got a big old grasp on how they were made and, and a lot of the stuff we cover in in a lot of senses is disney related like marvel or star wars and they're behind the scenes stuff and i think incredibly sterile and very deliberate everything is shown to you with a specific purpose in mind meanwhile watching stuff like behind the scenes for the descent or films that um maybe uh made in, made in a similar vein they come across so genuine candid like a group of friends who all have quite a solid skill set understanding their responsibilities but making sure that you know it's kind of like a life experience that's actually really fun and you're creating something that's really worthwhile in the meantime not something that's like packaged with the very deliberate uh intention of only making money that no one cares about you know yeah, very much so no, we did we did form a little family to make to make this movie and, and you know we hired a, a documentary uh, maker to, to be with us all the time and try and capture that, that essence in a way and that was kind of off the back of the experience i've had doing dog soldiers was kind of like i want this to be documented it's because this is back in the day when the wonder of dvds and you know dvd extras was prime you know we got some really good materials out of some of that but it seems to have gone away now and gone back to these kind of very, as you say, sterile, okay, five minutes, and the scene things that, that really don't show you much about experience in any kind of a way. Mm -hmm. That was a wonderfully fun experience. Thank you so much for giving your time for this sort of thing. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. We'll yeah, see you here tomorrow for therapy, watching yeah. The Descent too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> see, you in a, see you tomorrow. For that. Again, thank you so much. And, your pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Highly recommend The Descent. For anybody who decided to just watch this and not watch the film and haven't seen it, go and watch it. Really good. Yes, see it. Do it. Do it. On that note, thank you so much for listening. And we will see you next time, folks. Bye, bye, bye everyone. Toodaloo. Bye, bye. 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 What'd you bring me?